to be on campus from my own call, which starts. Ooh, you follow the rules of LA? Yeah, considering the fact that like Westville guys are sharing. You're not going to Claremont Craft Field that day? No. You don't have a drink while I'm on call. Oh, really? Is that a rule? Yeah. I think it's more of sort of like and an unofficial guideline for us. So. No, but because it's Halloween weekend as well, I'm like, kids really Actually, I'm going to be on Sunday as well. Well, thanks for being here today. Yeah, Are you no, coming tomorrow? Yeah, I'm on call. You're on call all day tomorrow? 5, 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. All right. Okay, well, yeah, we'll be missed. But... Yeah. Well, actually, it might be better. Yeah. Do you? I really think she was, like, based on the smell of it. Anyway, so someone else buy a book to work with that I'll go down and see if I can help her with that. Otherwise, uh, I, I talked to Jessica with this. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Water issues of other countries. Then, I don't know that the Chino <laughs> uh, things right, but, but is she probably does. Actually, she probably does. <laughs> well, um, we were just talking about, I know that there's an aquifer in the San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. that, and there's a water conservation district there, right? There's, um, there's the upper San Gabriel Municipal Water District, and there's the lower San Gabriel Water District. Okay. They're not a conservation district. So they have they run a lot of conservation programs. But There's somebody who's who's trying to refurbish the water. Yes, yes, yes. That's that? that. I think that's upper. I think that's the upper San Gabriel. The water is kind of widening out. Yes, even the county of LA. Um, yeah, the county of LA is really trying to come up with a set of lines. The one we are talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah. Well, it wasn't the natural truth. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but it's interesting and, because we and have our school is just there on the basins up here and uh, on the other side of the there's kind of a frontage yeah. room yeah. Front yeah. Front yeah. Front and, uh, and there's a couple of there's a couple of runoff of the mountain and it was actually daylight over here in Claremont um because there was it was actually right on the Oh, and so, so it wasn't moving. Yeah. So we ended up selling that. Yeah. Yeah. Ready to go? I think we're ready to go. All right. Okay. <laughs> we can all get seated. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, I want to see if there's an echo. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. No we echo. Hear, we hear you great. Okay. And there's, I, I thought there was an echo, but it's not. I don't hear an echo back. So that's fine. Great. Oh, that's good. That's what we want to hear. All right. So uh, I am pleased to announce our last presenter of the day uh, for this Eco Talk, Eric Olin Wright. Um, who is uh, an American analytic Marxist sociologist, uh, former president of the, what is it, the American Society of Sociology? Is that what it's called? The American Sociological Association. Sociological Association, ASA. Um, and a professor of sociology. Uh, and will be talking to us about real utopias as a pathway to an alternative future. Uh, cool. Perfect. So, thank you. So I'm... Uh... I'm pleased that this worked out. I, uh, I think that especially for environmental reasons, it's desirable that when there are conferences uh, and, you, and the conference organizers want to bring someone from distant places to come to speak, it's actually a good idea to try to work out routines where we can do this uh, remotely. It, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of my staying late in my office in Madison, Wisconsin, is much lower than getting on a plane and flying to California for, for a day or two and coming back. So let's just treat this as, uh, as an additional dimension of what it means to be environmentally conscious and to think of real utopian ways of constructing dialogue at long distance rather than simply uh, in the conventional ways. So <clears throat> here's what I wanna do. I want to discuss with you a general approach to thinking about alternatives that I've been working on since the uh, early 1990s. Uh, I use the expression real utopia as a way of kind of signaling this, the, uh, the central ambition of the approach, which is to hold on simultaneously to our deepest, utopia, our deepest utopian aspirations while being realistic in the specific sense of paying attention to the unintended consequences and dilemmas of actually putting our ideas into practice. Uh, real and utopia don't comfortably go together, but the lack of comfort is part of the point. These are not easy matters that can be resolved through any kind of uh, untroubled formula. It's always a question of grappling with trade-offs, tensions, contradictions, unintended consequences, and so on. So let me give you, what I'm gonna do is give a, a general sketch of the overall components of the way I approach these things. And then I'm gonna focus specifically on some problems in the idea of uh, transformation and the destination to which we are trying to move. Okay, so first, if we want to make the world a better place, there are four, uh, intellectual tasks. You can think of these as the four components of an emancipatory social theory. We need to specify the moral foundations of our search for a better world, for an alternative future. We need a diagnosis and critique of the world as it is in light of those moral foundations. We need an account of alternatives, where we want to go. And we need an account of the problem of transformation. How do we get from here to there? Uh, in, a, um, in a brief half hour presentation, I can't really elaborate in detail all of these components, but I do think it's worthwhile for me to say a little bit about each of them, and then I'll focus more in a more focused way on the third and fourth. So first, moral foundations. 
in my own work on these matters, I have focused on four clusters of values, which I feel are the appropriate values for passing judgment on the world as it is, as well as values for passing judgment on the world that we want, on the proposals for transformation. Uh, the four clusters are equality and fairness, democracy and freedom, community and solidarity, and sustainability. Let me just briefly, without any elaborated discussion, say what I mean by each of these. First, equality and fairness. Here's how I think about that couplet. In a just society, all persons would have broadly equal access to the material and social means necessary to live a flourishing life. The key idea here is equal access to what it takes to live a flourishing life. Doesn't, it's not exactly the same as equal opportunity, nor is it simply equality per se, it's equal access to the social and material means necessary to live a flourishing life. Uh, second, democracy and freedom. In a fully democratic society, all people would have broadly equal access to the necessary means to participate meaningfully in decisions about things which affect their lives. That's a lot packed into one statement. Again, equal access comes into play. A democratic society is one in which people have equal access to meaningfully participate in making decisions about things which affect their lives. Now, what that definition of democracy means is that the distance that, or the difference between democracy and freedom becomes a difference in context. If the decisions which affect your life affect you and only you, <coughs> then you should be able to do things without asking permission of anyone. That's what we mean by freedom. If your decisions, however, affect other people, they should be party to the decision as well. That's a pretty simple point. If you're going to do something that affects other people, uh, they should be part of the process by which that decision is made. You shouldn't be able to impose consequences on other people without their participation. Uh, democracy, then, is the term we use when the context requires cooperation and collaboration with other people in making decisions. Freedom is the term we use when the context does not require that. Uh, this means that the idea of democracy is more than just about the state. It's also about the organizations in which we live. Indeed, it's about the family. We can talk about a democratic or an autocratic family on the basis of whether the decisions that affect the members of the family are made unilaterally by a particular person or are made in collaboration with the other people in the family. Okay, that's democracy. Community and solidarity. <clears throat> Community and solidarity expresses the principle that people ought to cooperate with each other not simply because of what they personally get out of cooperation, but also out of a real commitment to the well-being of others and the principle of reciprocity. When that principle of cooperating with others because of a commitment to how well, other people's lives go, as well as the principle of reciprocity. When that applies to the mundane activities of everyday life, we use the word community. That's the value of community and the ordinary interactions with people in everyday life. When it's specifically directed towards the problem of collective action, uh, the term solidarity applies. And that's the value of community and solidarity. Finally, sustainability. I think of sustainability as the temporal version of each of the other three values. What sustainability means is that if we seek to improve conditions, the realization of the value of equality, democracy, and community, we need to think about it not simply in terms of the present moment, but also the sustainability of equality, democracy, and community over time. And specifically, this is a particular way of thinking about the problem of sustainability with respect to the environment, which of course is a major concern in the world today. I think of environmental sustainability as basically a problem of intergenerational fairness. 
future generations should have access to the social and material means to live flourishing lives at least at the same level as the present generation. The moral issue in an unsustainable future is that we are imposing harms on future generations. Uh, that is a particularly anthropocentric view of the environment. Some environmentalists will criticize me for that and have. Uh, I think the reason we care, we, the reason I care about global warming is because of the way in which damage to the environment harms human beings, uh, particularly human beings in the future. Uh, if we were uh, in a moment where we were having an impending ice age and we were facing a a problem of uh, the glaciers gradually moving down from the north, and then we discovered that global warming was occurring, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, I would be concerned about global warming because of its impact over time on future generations of people. And that's what sustainability as a value means. It means concern for future generations with respect to all three of these values. All right, that's the moral foundations in a rapid brief tour. The diagnosis and critique of capitalism then has as its core argument that capitalism obstructs the realization of these values. That's the claim. It's a controversial claim because people often believe that capitalism itself um, encourages some of these values. We often hear the uh, story, for example, that capitalism <clears throat> enhances the value of freedom. Uh, whereas I argue, in fact, that capitalism obstructs the value of freedom by distributing the resources under which people can act freely. They can put their own plans and purposes into effect, distributing the resources necessary to be free in such a dramatically unequal way. Uh, capitalism obstructs democracy by taking out of the arena of collective decision making all sorts of decisions which massively affect the lives of other people. That's what private ownership of the means of production does. Private ownership of the means of production means I have the right to deploy my property as I wish, even if it results in the devastation of the well-being of people in a particular community. You know, if I own a factory, if I'm a, an owner of a large enterprise and I want to move it away to some other place, I don't have to worry about what its impact is on the lives of other people and they have no right to interfere with my decision. That's what it means for me to be the owner. Uh, and that's fundamentally undemocratic. Rights of private property, when it's at the expense of other people, when it has impacts on the lives of other people, the right of private property is an anti-democratic right. Uh, the central thesis then of my diagnosis and critique of capitalism in terms of those five values, <clears throat> of those four values, is that capitalism obstructs the realization of these values. It creates massive inequalities in the distribution of wealth and income that violate principles of fairness and social justice. It cripples and obstructs democracy through giving private people power over others. Competition and commodification within capitalism undermines community and solidarity, pitting people against each other rather than fostering conditions for sustained reciprocity and cooperation. And in terms of sustainability, particularly with respect to the environment, capitalism inherently threatens the quality of the environment for future generations because of the imperatives for consumerism and endless growth. Well, those are the first two steps of my four tasks, the moral foundations and the diagnosis and critique. Now I wanna shift gears <coughs> to the other two problems, the question of alternatives, how to think about them, and then the very knotty problem of how to make those alternatives real, how to actualize them. So first, thinking about alternatives in terms of real utopias. The oxymoron real and utopia together suggests that um, we combine two ideas about alternatives. First, Utopia signals that we seek alternatives to dominant institutions that embody our deepest aspirations for a just and humane world. The real in real utopia disciplines our thinking about alternatives 
to search that to search for alternatives that can be built in the world as it is that also prefigure the world as it could be. Uh, real utopias therefore combine the moral the effort to realize in practice these moral ideals with the practical task of building those ideals in the world as it is in ways that prefigure the world as it could be. Okay, that's all very abstract. Let me now give you a big list of examples. I'll come back to this, this abstract formulation when, we, when I talk about transformation, how to get from here to there. But let me flesh out the idea, not through more abstract discussion, but by giving you a list. Now, this is way too big a list <laughs> to discuss in the context of a, a short talk. L let me just, I give you the full list here so that you can <coughs> see this sort of spectrum of things I'm talking about. Let me just bounce around on this list uh, a little bit. I will uh, later speak more specifically about uh, unconditional basic income. By the way, when I move my cursor across the screen, do you see it so you can see what I'm pointing to? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. So. There's, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, so what am I talking about? Okay, first, uh, when, if we're thinking about uh, production, worker cooperatives and various other forms of cooperative organizations, sometimes called solidarity cooperatives and a new uh, innovation called union cooperatives. Worker cooperatives are firms that are owned and run by their employees in a democratic manner. They're they embody the values of community and, and democracy to a much greater extent than capitalist firms, and uh, also the value of equality. Although most worker cooperatives retain significant levels of internal inequalities, uh, those inequalities are muted relative to the inequalities in capitalist firms. Peer-to-peer -peer collaborative production. Wikipedia is an example of a profoundly non-capitalist way of producing a uh, collective resource of a, of a massive encyclopedia. Wikipedia is, if you think about it, it's clearly impossible. It, it, it can't really exist uh, to have several hundred thousand people around the world collaborating to produce a free encyclopedia uh, without being paid and in which anybody can edit anybody else's entry and which ends up being pretty good. That kind of peer-to-peer -peer collaborative production represents a whole way of thinking about how you cooperate to produce things that's different from the conventional capitalist way of doing it. Uh, let me skip down to something that's quite familiar. Uh, libraries, free publicly provided goods and services. Public libraries are real utopias in my view. Libraries embody a principle that all people are fundamentally equal that how rich you are shouldn't determine your access to books, uh, CDs, movies, or whatever else libraries have uh, on their shelves. Uh, if they have to be rationed, they're rationed by time. You get on a waiting list. Walk into a library and the distribution principle is to each according to need uh, rather than to each according to the ability to pay. Well, there's more items on this list I, uh, we, in the q and A, I'll be happy to um, elaborate more of these. I can put this um, particular slide back up after the talk. Uh, but now what I'd like to do is to shift gears to the question of what it means to actually try to create a world in which these kinds of organizations dominate and displace capitalist forms of production as at, at the center of the economy. And this involves uh, the fourth item on that broad agenda of the tasks for making the world a better place, uh, thinking about transformation. There are traditionally four principal responses. You can think of these as strategic responses to the harms of capitalism. So assuming that you accept my diagnosis and critique that the deficits in those values are to a significant extent the result of the fact that we live in, an in a world in which capitalism dominates our economic lives. For the moment, just assume that that's correct. 
Uh, there are four strategic responses, smashing capitalism, taming capitalism, resisting capitalism, and escaping capitalism. Uh, smashing capitalism corresponds to the sort of classic idea of a revolutionary seizure of power that seizes the state and uses the power of the state to radically and rupturally transform the economic system, destroying the centers of capitalist power and replacing them with an alternative. That was the a uh, vision of revolutionary socialism and communism in the 20th century as a as a way of imagining how you move from a capitalist to a more emancipatory alternative, smashing capitalism. The, the last line of the um, Wobbly's song, Solidarity Forever, says, we will build a new world from the ashes of the old, a very vivid uh, imagery build a new world from the ashes of the old. You burn down the old world and then build a new one. That's smashing capitalism. Taming capitalism was the strategy of um, social democracy and more democratic electoral forms of socialism. The idea was that capitalism creates great harms, but it's possible through the use of state power, even in a capitalist economy, to create various forms of public policies that neutralize the worst harms of capitalism. It's tamed, it becomes domesticated. I like to think that taming capitalism actually renders capitalism less capitalist. It's not just that you have an unfettered capitalism and then you compensate for its harms, you actually reduce its capitalist character. Uh, you take various kinds of property rights away from owners of the means of production. That is, you don't allow them to use their means of production in certain ways. That's what an anti-pollution set of regulations does. Uh, what, what it means to, <clears throat> and health and safety rules do. What it means to have anti-pollution and health and safety rules is to say to uh, an owner of the means of production, you are not allowed to use that property just as you wish. You have to conform to these rules, and that means that those powers have been taken away from capital. And that's a less purely capitalist capitalism. That's taming capitalism. Resisting capitalism, of course, is the most pervasive response to the harms of capitalism. That's all of the ways in which ordinary people, when faced with these harms, try to resist them at the, at the micro level of everyday life. Uh, when when workers on the shop floor engage in various kinds of collective action, they are resisting the harms of capitalism from below. Uh, when communities organize against a toxic waste dump, they are resisting capitalism through collective action in a community. Resisting capitalism is typically defensive. It's trying to neutralize the harms of capitalism rather than transform its basic structures. Uh, but it's also uh, a key component of the social and political environment under which taming capitalism becomes possible. Taming capitalism is really only possible when you have people who are resisting capitalism and then lend their support to political efforts to actually transform the institutions. Finally, escaping capitalism refers to all the ways in which people have tried to escape the harms of capitalism by creating alternatives in which they can live and work. Uh, when, um, when people moved to the Western frontier in the United States as homesteaders, they were pretty much mostly trying to escape capitalism. They wanted to be subsistence producers who would live on the land and produce for themselves and their families. Uh, they weren't moving West to get their homestead plot in order to open up agribusinesses, they were mainly subsistence farmers producing for themselves and then marketing whatever surplus they might produce. Worker co-ops, as I've already mentioned, is an example of trying to escape capitalism. Not escape capitalism in the sense of completely cut yourself off from capitalism, although sometimes that's also what people do. In certain kinds of utopian communities, people actually retreat completely from the capitalist world in certain kinds of intentional communities. Um, <clears throat> forming a cooperative, a worker cooperative is trying to escape the harms of capitalism by creating an alternative while still engaging in the market and, and having to interact with capitalist firms. So these are the four principal strategic responses to the harms of capitalism. 
I propose a fifth one, which I call eroding capitalism. And the fifth strategic response to capitalism is the one where the idea of real utopias is located. Eroding capitalism in effect combines taming, resisting, and escaping. The basic strategic vision is this. We should resist capitalism from below in ways that make possible taming capitalism from above in order to expand the possibility of building real utopia alternatives that erode the overall dominance of capitalism. So there's a lot packed in there. Just to say it again in slightly different terms, the idea is to think of ways in which we can engage politically to tame capitalism, to expand the spaces in, this, in the society within which we can get on with the business of building the alternatives that we want. Uh, capitalism as an economic system is not all dominant. Capitalism as an economic system occupies the most powerful center of the economic structure, but there's all sorts of cracks and niches and inconsistencies within an economic system that makes possible the building of alternatives. That's why we can have public libraries alongside of bookstores. Uh, we can build public libraries <clears throat> as a way of creating a non-capitalist form of access to books in spite of the fact that the market is organized around private sellers of books through bookstores. The idea then here is to mobilize from below to make possible taming capitalism from above so that we can build these alternatives. But particularly, we want to build alternatives that cumulatively over time erode the overall dominance of capitalism. We build the alternative inside of the old society in the hope of eventually being able to displace the dominance of capitalism itself. Uh, let me give you a, a more specific example of, some, of, a, of a kind of public policy and change in the structure as it exists, a form of taming capitalism that I think would accomplish a lot with respect to opening up space for the erosion of the dominance of capitalism. That is unconditional basic income. Unconditional basic income is an idea that's getting a fair amount of, of traction these days. It's, uh, it used to be discussed only in sort of the esoteric circles of academics, but now it's become on the political agenda in a number of countries in Europe and uh, increasingly discussed even in the United States. Uh, the basic idea is pretty simple. Every legal resident of a uh, jurisdiction, a country, let's say, gets a monthly check sufficient to meet their basic needs. Uh, let's call that a monthly stipend that's uh, a bit above the poverty line. So it's not meant to be a austerity life, but a no frills, but decent standard of living. Everybody unconditionally gets an basic needs. It's given to all legal residents without any work or other requirements. It goes to the rich as well as the poor. Bill Gates gets it as well as a homeless person gets it. Uh, virtuous people get it, but also unvirtuous people. There's no, no conditionality to it. Of course, uh, this replaces a whole host of other income transfer programs. There's no need for uh, welfare payments, for example, or uh, unemployment benefits if you everybody has their basic needs guaranteed through a unconditional basic income. So you get rid of a whole set of income transfer payments and you replace them with a system that is administratively extremely inexpensive. It, uh, this costs very little to administer uh, and it does because it doesn't require monitoring. You don't have to uh, check on people's income as you do in means-tested programs or check on whether they're actually looking for work as in unemployment benefits. The unconditionality simples it administratively and makes it available to all. Of course, taxes have to go up. And for some people, taxes will go up by way more than the basic income. So although ba uh, Bill Gates will get a basic income, his tax rates are gonna go up by vastly more than the basic income. 
so it's not the case that this is a kind of free lunch. No, it's paid for. It is redistributive. It takes income from high earners and makes it available to everybody, but everybody gets it. Well, there's lots of issues to discuss around basic income. Uh, some people object to it even on principle, even if it could work. Mostly when you discuss it at length with people, the main objection is it's too expensive. You know, it's just gonna cost too much to give everybody a basic income. Or people say, if you give everybody a basic income, very few people are gonna work for pay. And as a result, you won't generate the necessary taxes to fund the basic income. The system will just blow up in your face. That's another kind of objection. Let's, we can discuss that, let's put that aside. Let me tell you why I think it's such a important idea and what it would accomplish with respect to my general approach to thinking about real utopias. Unconditional basic income makes it possible for people to disengage from the capitalist economy and to begin organizing their life plans and their economic activities around non-capitalist relations, non-capitalist social relations. So let's just take the simplest example, a worker cooperative. Worker cooperatives become economically much more stable and much more viable if the workers who are working in a worker cooperative have their basic needs meant, met independently of the success of their small business. Uh, small farms become much more viable. I mean, the unconditional basic income has an interesting set of implications for agriculture because uh, small farmers suddenly have their basic needs met independently of their success as farmers, and they become, in effect, uh, much more competitive with agribusiness. Indeed, agricultural labor becomes a problem in big business, but not in big farms, but not in small farms. Uh, agricultural laborers would also get a basic income which would mean that in order to attract labor into farms uh, as, as agricultural laborers, uh, higher wages will have to be offered because people have the opportunity to say no. So unconditional basic income makes cooperatives more viable. It makes the performing arts more viable. People can opt for a life of, with a very low carbon footprint of, in theater and the arts much more easily if their basic standard of living, enough to get by in a decent but not extravagant way, is provided independently of their ability to sell tickets to their performances. So in these and all sorts of other ways which we could discuss, I think basic income opens up a space. It solves a, a pressing problem within capitalism itself, that is the problem of extreme inequality, poverty, and the suffering that that brings. So it solves that problem but it does so in a way that opens up a space for people to engage in building alternatives. And that's where this dynamic character that I think of as real utopias comes uh, into play. So unconditional basic income then is one example in this long list of examples. Uh, this then leads to one final question. Could the expansion and deepening of real utopias of the sort that are listed here, this long list of interesting and heterogeneous possibilities, could the expansion and deepening of such examples ever cumulatively erode the dominance of capitalism? Are they doomed to remain on the fringes in small niches leave, leaving capitalist power hegemonic? Whoops, sorry. Well, in place of an answer, let me say the following. The future limits of possibility are opaque. We cannot know in advance how far we can go in building emancipatory alternatives within capitalism that push us beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, very much. And um, that fits into the themes of this conference incredibly. Could you go back in your slideshow to the alternatives slide uh, where you uh, defined real utopia the first time? It was that okay. one slide with the two uh, phrases. There it is. That one? Yeah. yeah. Because that's the alternatives theme is the one that we've been working on 
So we're kind of an open dialogue group, not very hierarchical. So um, I'll just let people jump in unless it's total chaos. Um, and so ask questions or make a comment. Let's see if, despite the distance, if we can just do a dialogue with you like we were in your class. Sure, right. sure, absolutely. <clears throat> so just jump in and I'll stay behind so nobody can get to raise a hand. I was going to just have you jump in, but if it doesn't work, I'll call it in. <laughs> um, is, is, there a, is there a way of making my view of the audience fill the screen so that in that, if, if we can do that, then I can actually see people. At the moment, you're just tiny little. <laughs> we, uh, we look better that way. But if you, um, <laughs> if you stop sharing your screen, sharing your PowerPoint. Um, OK, I, stop share. Wait. Oh shoot! I went right down. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah. oh, okay, I can, I can, I can share again. I'll go back. Okay, but anyway, uh, now do you see us bigger? Yeah, that makes it bigger. Okay. Let's see if it, share I'm screen. Having... Okay, you got it back. Do you want to write that down or? Yeah, we're going to use it in our closing uh, lecture. But um, so Zach is going to start with this question, and in about ten seconds. Oh, hello. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. We're good. Now I. Now I now I can see you all. Yeah, we're good. Go ahead. Just leave it that way. It works. OK. Hello, everybody. Now that I can see you. Hi. Hi, Eric. This is Zach. Um, I'm a Hi. PhD Hi. student here at Claremont School of Theology. Uh, hopefully, this isn't uh, too technical, but I, I sort of am curious what you think about um, post-capitalism, because it incorporates many of the uh, sort of approaches and projects that you listed. Um, within sort of different camps and different uh, strategies. So for instance, there are, there's a sort of degrowth movement on one you know, sort of side, and there's a sort of accelerationist on another sort of side. And I'm just curious how you see uh, different groups applying exactly what you said, universal basic income, peer-to-peer -peer networks, new digital technologies, solidarity economics, in a, in a more holistic sort of overall plan, because they go in different right. strategic directions. Right. So I, uh, the term post-capitalism is a convenient one because it's empty, right? It doesn't, it's just post, <laughs> post something. <laughs> there are some dreadful things that we can imagine are post-capitalist. You know, we can imagine a very barbaric authoritarian state-centered domination in the face of global warming. Indeed, if you had to put your money on, as it were, on what's the most likely political outcome of the cataclysm we face with respect to global warming, it's unlikely to be a democratic, egalitarian, solidaristic economic structure. It's much more likely to be an elite dominated authoritarian form of statism of some sort, uh, neo-barbarism or whatever you want to call it. So post-capitalism is a little too, um, vague, I think, about what you want. Uh, I, perhaps out of nostalgia, still use the word socialist to describe what I think of as the alternative, in which what I mean by socialism is a radically democratic society. It's sort of democratization all the way down. A uh, democratic economy is what I mean by a socialist economy. Now, if you think of socialism as taking democracy seriously, then it is institutionally very heterogeneous. It includes all sorts of forms. Worker cooperatives are a form of socialist economy. Uh, <coughs> public libraries are a form of socialist economy. Municipal organization of, of, of land trusts under which urban community agriculture can take place. That would be a form of socialist economy. It's not that there's a single institutional form, and we say we apply this to everything, rather it's a single moral principle that we apply to everything, equality, democracy, and uh, community under conditions of sustainability. Now, that means that a lot of the things you mentioned do fall under my encompassing idea, because they all fit under this broad notion of a democratic, solidaristic, egalitarian form of economic organization. Uh, <clears throat> they differ from things like from some of these currents because I do insist on the importance of the state. Um, so the anarchist perspective that imagines we could transform the world 
and ignore the state, I think, is is a fantasy. Uh, the state plays a crucial role in coordination and mobilizing resources uh, and in enabling the sustainability of democratic, solidaristic economic relations. Yeah. Should I, uh, why don't somebody, I mean, I can call on you because I can see most of you now, but I, there's people off to your left. Of, I think you're left. <laughs> That yes. I can't see. Okay, we're going to move the screen so you can get close up on the questioner. I, I'm on the okay. left. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, John Forty. Uh, hi, John. Hi. What we're seeing uh, in the case of a populace that is uh, largely poorly educated. Uh, as opposed to what Jefferson Madison felt we needed to have a, for a viable democracy, uh, what we're getting is the politics of resentment uh, instead, and uh, especially as they work it out in this election. And uh, how do you uh, counter that uh, lack of education, lack of solidarity uh, uh, that's taking us nowhere? Right. Uh, you know, I would I would characterize the Trump type phenomenon just slightly different. It's not that I disagree that it's a politics of resentment, but it's uh, even more in a way a politics of fear. You know, if we want to, if we there's this big contrast between the political advantages that the right wing and the left have that the right is able to mobilize fear by targeting people as the objects of fear, much better than the left is, but for a good reason, because that's not the agenda of the left. It, the, the thing about fear is it, um, it evokes very simple solutions, whereas a politics of hope always involves complex solutions. All of the things that we want require patient institution building, thinking through the unintended consequences of alternatives, and worrying about what happens when you too rapidly try to make a transition from one set of institutions to another. The right wing doesn't have to worry about that. They want to destroy capacity, not build capacity, and they want to mobilize fear rather than mobilize positive, uh, constructive alternatives. Okay, so that's just the context in which <laughs> It's a kind of unfair fight in a period of great uncertainty. Typically, the right wing does have an advantage in mobilization. And I, I don't have, if, if I had a magical way of saying, no, th if you just do this, we could counter it. <laughs> you know, it'd be fantastic. I don't. I think that uh, it, it's education, talking to people, creating alternatives on the ground and showing they work. Uh, working at the local level to build more resilient communities so people feel involved and engaged in their communities in ways in which they feel empowered in the face of uncertainty rather than fearful in the face of uncertainty. I mean, those are all the kind of obvious things to do that are extremely hard. <laughs> Lots of hands. I don't... You've been trying to get in, so we should let you go. Um, so uh, I'm an MA in CST. So uh, I have a question about. Uh, your, Hi. Uh, Hi. <laughs> I have a question about you know globalization issue. You know when we can you know, expand our community into the world. You know nowadays you know McDonald's, car makers, and even Christianity are you know spread from the Western civilization to the world, right? So then, is there any right. insight like? You you gave us uh, such a specific example like the un un uh, unconditional basic wage. So is there any yeah. specific picture about re real utopia in the sense of uh, world matters, or is there any specific I mean, um, ways that? So we sure. Well, there's there's I lots of ideas about building real utopias globally, not just nationally. Uh, and uh, there are examples. Um, I mean, just a uh, a simple example from the cooperative movement. There, there's a uh, there's a 
coffee roaster cooperative in Madison called Just Coffee that only imports coffee from coffee grower cooperatives, especially in Central America. And uh, Just Coffee, along with some other cooperative roasters in North America, organized a cooperative importer to act as the intermediary. So you have a cooperative commodity chain, cooperative farmers in Central America, a cooperative importer and cooperative roasters. So that's an example of organizing <coughs> cooperative principles across national borders. One can also think about, and there are proposals for, an unconditional basic income as a global basic income. Now, of course, we don't have the institutions capable of actually doing that, so it's an idea rather than a practical innovation. We don't have the kind of, the United Nations doesn't function as the kind of political entity that could actually enforce and execute a global basic income. But there's good discussions about what a, a global basic income would indeed look like. Uh, there's a very interesting proposal by a young Belgian sociologist named Isabella Ferraris, a very interesting young woman, uh, about uh, democratizing the multinational corporation, which seems like a preposterous idea. How could you possibly democratize the multinational corporation? And um, her her basic argument, just in, in a nutshell, it looks like this. In the early modern period, before we had democratic states, what did we have? We had monarchies with absolute power. And the monarchs often, in the end, had to negotiate with the great landed ar aristocrats, the big property owners of their era. So the big property or owners formed a chamber in the national in the government, you know, in the society called the House of Lords. And the negotiations occurred between the CEO of the company country and the property owners, the House of Lords. But eventually, for political and social and conflictual reasons, a House of Commons gets created, which represents the non-landlords, the ordinary people. And eventually you get three actors engaged in negotiations and squabbles and political wrangling, a House of Commons representing citizens, a House of Lords representing property owners, and the monarch, et, et cetera. Now, if you look at multinational corporations, the largest multinational corporations control a bigger economy than all but the top 10 countries. So if we think of a multinational corporation as a country that just isn't territorial, it's just a different kind of country, it, it's run by not a king, we call them CEOs, and we don't have a House of Lords, we have a House of Share Owners. It's called the Board of Directors. Yeah. So her proposal is that we have uh, elections to a, a second chamber, a second Board of Directors, that every corporation is required to have two Boards of Directors that represent the two main investors in the corporation, people who invest their labor and people who invest their capital. The property owners get one share, one vote, the people who invest their labor in the corporation get one person, one vote. So we have a chamber, we have a board of directors of workers, a board of directors of share owners, and then the king, the CEO. And uh, the political process then requires that the board of directors of workers be elected by all the workers of a multinational corporation. So it forces a cross national electoral politics within the corporation. Well, it's a fantasy. You know, this isn't going to happen. We there's no e obvious political route that we can imagine imposing that as a constraint on a corporation. Uh, it's still worth thinking about, and it's always possible that you'll find some multinational corporation that has a kind of progressive bent and feels that the way in which it can resolve some of its internal conflicts and mobilize greater loyalty and commitment by its employees would be to try out this kind of bicameral board of directors for a corporate structure. Well, that would be another example of how one can think in this case more theoretically rather than practically about a real, real utopias that have a global character to them.
I, I'd like to make a comment to then set up the question. That's all right with you? Sure. It's funny that in, say, neuroscience or biology, the concept of stasis, uh, the idea that we regulate our internal systems to these optimal parameters is a sort of mainstay. Uh, we think that in terms of biological organism regulation, this is an important principle. In economics, it's funny that the term stasis is uh, it's like a death knell, right? Uh, in a growth sort of capitalist economy, growth, 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 the notion of balance or optimal equilibrium is a term that's out of play. We're not, that's not the goal of, it seems, our current economic system. So to preface that by saying there seems like there are some problems with this capitalist structure, this growth-only economy, that we go against our own biology in a way. The principle that underwrites biological systems is a bad term in economic systems. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Building off of that, I had a question for you. You talked about the four strategic responses, and I found it really funny that two of those four strategic responses, can you, can you repeat them real quick? Smashing, taming, resisting, and escaping. Thank you. It's really funny that the final two of those four, this seems to follow the SEER approach. Uh, so if you are during times of war, if you are, um, if you go into enemy, if you're taken by an enemy combatant, uh, there are programs that they teach for survival, evasion, resistance, and, and escape. So the two of the four that you mentioned in your approach, this actually seems to be modeled on a military model for escaping a captor when you're captive. Okay, you missed up. We got so you had three questions. Yeah, five, so the, qu the question is uh, simply, do you think that that's intentional? And are, <laughs> I mean, are we captives in a capitalist society? So, I mean, the reason, there, there's a whole elaborate analysis in which I generate those four strategies. The characteristic of the, the, the third and the fourth, resisting and escaping, is that they're micro strategies, whereas taming and smashing are macro strategies. And that's, of course, the training you give soldiers in a war are also micro strategies. The, the army is engaged in a macro strategy to defeat the whole apparatus of the enemy. But if you're captured, then you need a micro strategy. How are you going to survive as a small group or individual soldiers. So resisting and escaping become micro. So there's a there's a there's at least an analogy between the micro macro logic of military conflict and the micro macro logic of struggles against a system like capitalism. Um, in terms of the biological, idea, the biological systems idea, now the reason why we have a, a notion of a stasis and equilibrium within a biological system comes, of course, from the uh, evolutionary logic by which biological systems come into existence and, be, and reproduce over time. That's, uh, we have a mechanism of feedback of natural selection. The problem in social systems is that there is no, there's no natural equal, equilibrating mechanism. It has to be one that is purposefully, intentionally created, as opposed to just functionally emergent. Uh, economic systems don't have any endogenous evolutionary logic that produces that kind of positive feedback of the right sort. We can create that, but it requires institutions. It's not going to just, it's not going to happen behind our backs. It, it can only happen by design. And there the problem for capitalism is that the stability of capitalism, that is its stasis as a structure, depends upon its growth. It's not the kind of system that can be reproduced stably, uh, at least as far as we know, stably, in the absence of growth. Because in the absence of growth, every conflict becomes a zero-sum conflict. The problem of social integration and social peace under conditions of stasis becomes, I think, intractable. And growth is the way out of that problem. Uh, that's why, you know, when, when we had the Great Recession of 2008, no politician stood up and said, thank God we have this economic collapse. Now we can get some sanity into our economic system. This degrowth is great. Uh, and of course, since people are suffering, we have to massively redistribute from those who are well off because you can't have stasis, let alone degrowth, without a lot of redistribution, because otherwise there's going to be massive suffering. Okay, rich guys, don't you think this is a good idea? No, nobody said that. <laughs> Restarting, you know, so that's the problem that a capitalist economy, in order to be socially stable, requires dynamic growth. Great. Okay, we had two questions in the front row. Go ahead. 
Um, yeah, so I agree that uh, socialism is democracy taken seriously. Um, uh, you also said um, the state is necessary for an emancipatory politics. Um, and you talked about some ways of democratizing the economy, like uh, worker cooperatives and uh, basic income and a second chamber for corporations, which I think workers could win in a strike theoretically. Um, but if there's demands to democratize the economy, how do you democratize the state to be a willing actor in supporting uh, workers who are trying to democratize the economy? Right. right, so that's a fantastically important question. Uh, there's one long-standing view in the Marxist tradition which says that it is impossible to make any headway in democratizing the economy under conditions of a capitalist state. That is a state that's designed to function well for a capitalist economy simply isn't a possible vehicle for the political reforms needed for a more democratic economy. That you can call that an impossibility theorem. And that impossibility theorem leads to the conclusion that either we have to overthrow the state or we can't do anything. You know, and if that's true, then I think we can't do anything. I mean, I think if the only way to make progress, serious progress on a more democratic, egalitarian and solidaristic economy, if the only way to do that is to actually overthrow the state, then that means it's not possible because I don't think that's possible in, in advanced, complex, capitalist economies. I think the attempt to, to do that will produce something that we don't want. Uh, the experience of the effort at seizing state power to transform economic structures has never led to a democratic, egalitarian, solidaristic economy. It just hasn't. Uh, we will build a new world under the in the ashes of the old. We've shown that we can burn down the old society, so to speak. It is possible to have the ashes but the new world that's built is not the one that we intended. We, meaning progressive, democratically minded people. So then the question is, is this just wishful thinking on my part? Or is it possible, however imperfect an instrument a capitalist state is, is it possible to use a capitalist state for non-capitalist purposes? And I think it is. I think that the capitalist state is not a coherent, finely tuned machine that is designed in such a way that it blocks all possibilities for the advance of more democratic possibilities. Uh, but it's difficult and it requires action that is um, what one might say multi-layered. Uh, local, local efforts to build democratic spaces are crucial to create a kind of foundation for struggles over more democratic spaces at higher levels of the system. And a variety of things that people are, are doing these days, things like participatory budgeting in cities and community land trusts, which take land out of the market and make it available for community deliberation, for, for purposes of community deliberation, all sorts of things. And, and, and for that matter, unconditional basic income, if it should come to pass. All of these can be thought of as enabling, <laughs> creating more democratic alternatives. And I think they're all possible under a capitalist state, just difficult. <laughs> okay, um, we're almost out of time. Let's do two final questions, Pat and Sherry Kling, briefly, okay. and some at brief answers, and then we'll go to answers. Well, I'm going, I'm Pat, and I'm going to the item that you put up about democracy and freedom <laughs> as the uh, uh, delineating which, uh, when it only applies to an individual versus when it impacts the demos. And it seems that if you go into a more of a socialistic direction, that changes. For example, um, if we have a basic minimum income for everyone, then uh, I might care how many kids you have. Or if we have a universal health care, I might care how healthy a lifestyle you have. So do you have ways of, uh, of it, providing incentives uh, it, when you get more of a democratic system going? Right. Yeah, so you've identified an absolutely foundational problem, which 
one way of talking about it is how do we draw the distinction between the public and the private once we acknowledge that our actions affect other people and they should participate in the decision, okay? Now, my view is there is no natural line of demarcation between public and private. It's something that we have to collectively decide upon in as consensual a way as possible. That is, we have to deliberate about it and try to converge on an understanding of what kinds of decisions and choices we wish to leave up to people without them ever having to ask permission, because we think lives will go better if we, if we do it that way. And which ones we wanna say, no, we wanna regulate these, we want it to be collectively decided. Um, it surely would be a monstrous world if everything you do that has any effect on anybody else, those other people have to be part of the decision. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just unthinkable. You'd be spending all your time talking to people about, can I do this, can I do that? Because your actions always have those ramifications. No, you have to draw a boundary, but that boundary isn't given by nature. It's socially created, and therefore it requires our collective collaboration to figure it out. Uh, now, I would hope that one of the great achievements of a liberal society has been to expand that boundary considerably in some ways that I think are good. So for example, around sexuality, all of a sudden in the last few decades, we have tremendously expounded the boundary of the private by saying, no, you don't have to ask permission if you want to have sexual relations with someone of your own sex. You know, that it was previously prohibited. You can now do it if you want to. It's just uh, up to individuals to, to choose. So we've expanded some forms of the private, the domain where you don't have to, where there's no regulation from others. Uh, but on private property, what we've done is made things even worse than they were before. I mean, the, the uh, strengthening of intellectual property rights is a massive expansion of uh, the right to, for people to privately control information and the use of information and the use of knowledge in all sorts of ways that are clear, in my judgment, clearly socially destructive. And more generally, the whole anchoring of the notion of privacy in private property is to me uh, a distinctive feature of capitalism. And that's at its core what's wrong with capitalism. I mean, that's the feature of capitalism allocating huge public powers to private persons over our economic life uh, that a democratic economy challenges. But around other areas that we've expanded privacy, uh, around one's body, for example, I would hope that there would be a, <laughs> a converging consensus that those are achievements and should be protected. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, Final question, Sherry Kling, and then we need to let you go. Hi, Eric. Hi, Sherry. Sherry. Hi. I um, was recently reading a text that referred to the work of, I think, Victor Turner and talking about ritual and that one of the things that collective ritual does is it, um, because people experience something that lifts them out of their cell, out of themselves, collectively, that then people can participate in hierarchical structures more democratically because it sort of equalizes things. And in the absence, you know, as religious institutions have lost their grip and lost their power um, in our society, I'm thinking that maybe the arts is one way to have collective ritual. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, if you have given any thought to the role of collective ritual in creating these kinds of, um, you know, real utopias that you talk about. Well, remember the third of my values is community and solidarity. <coughs> and, and of course it is the case that used in its broadest sense, uh, collective rituals are part of what renders communities communities and which provides the, um, the emotional bulwark for solidarity. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, for example, good protest movements always have good songs. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. It's actually, for those of um, my generation, I noticed there's at least a few of my generation in the audience. You know, when we think back to the protests of the 60s, 
Uh, one of the things that we're most nostalgic for is the music, the songs. And one of the things I, you know, regret about current protests that I participate in is that they don't have the same kind of music. They have drums. I mean, the much better drumming today than there was back <laughs> in the day. But, um, and, uh, you know, in, in Wisconsin five years ago, when we had the occupation of the state capitol for 17 days, uh, what was really striking was how the older folks would be singing these solidarity songs and the younger people loved it. They all learned them. And that was an occasion where all the old songs were back on the floor and on the table. And that's what people did at night. There was uh, this huge ritualistic celebration of music. Uh, but when they, when the younger folks themselves were animating the energy, it was with drum circles, which I, I think are also powerful forms of ritual and certainly long history in human civilization. So yes, I do think ritual plays a role. Uh, ritual is a interesting phenomenon because it's, if it's, it, they can easily feel contrived if they don't have a kind of organic, you know, relationship to the culture and the people who are doing it. You know, when you have these uh, team building exercises by corporations where they try to create, <laughs> it, feels, it, it always seems so contrived and artificial uh, that it doesn't, I think, accomplish what a true ritual does, which is from the heart. Right. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Eric for joining us. Thank you. I, uh, I, I very much uh, enjoyed meeting you. And in addition to ritual, of course, one of the things we can't do is break bread together, which is another way of establishing the, uh, the soul to soul fabric of a community. So I'm going to bike home now on a, uh, a cold autumn evening in Madison, Wisconsin to break bread with my family, but I'll do so at, in a spiritual connection with you in California. <laughs> Thank you, nice. Eric. Well, we felt that spiritual connection because though you hadn't sat through today's meeting, you spoke to it in some amazing ways. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. synchronicity or sameness of thought, like-mindedness and like-heartedness is a, is a powerful testimony to something happening around us. I think these things, these ideas and these impulses are definitely happening. It's not just uh, idle talk by well-meaning people. So yeah, I agree. Okay. Thanks very much. Nice Take to care. meet all of you. Bye. Okay, you guys, there's so instead of going downstairs, because there's some people that leave need to leave around